My name is Pastor Tony. I'm the youth pastor here. Um, let me just say, let me just say, uh, anytime I get a chance to preach, I, I'm going to take a little bit of a chance to brag on the students here at Hillside. Uh, if you don't know, you need to know, we have some of the most amazing students you could have in Napa. Um, we have some uh, amazing kids who are doing some amazing things. Pastor Eric told you a few weeks ago that, that we started our fourth Bible club, um, and, and that was in a middle school of Harvest Middle School, and so that's, that's pretty cool. Teresa's smiling really big over there because her daughter is one of the girls that leads it, and uh, um, so we, we're seeing about 40, 50 kids come to that, and uh, we're already in the works of trying to get another one at the school right next door at River. We're working on some options and stuff and trying to get something started there. But God's doing some amazing, amazing things in, in your students, and so you guys should be uh, very, very proud of them um, because uh, they're pretty amazing, and I can't help but brag on them when, when uh, I get a chance to. Uh, I have two jobs this morning. One, I have a job to preach the Word. The other job is to keep Pastor Eric awake. Um, Apparently, apparently, I might have a voice that puts him to sleep. I, I don't know, um, but we will we will we will try to keep him. We'll, we'll try to keep him awake. Yeah, the group behind you is a little rambunctious this morning. Um, they they will keep you up. Amy knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, to get be a little crazy. Um, but today, I'm 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 really excited to be able to preach in this series of Samuel. I don't know. If you guys have felt this, but I feel like since we've started the book of Samuel, man, it's been pretty heavy, deep stuff, um, and, and deep stuff in a good way. So a lot of times we say deep, and, and uh, in church, we feel like we leave church feeling like, oh man, I just got beat up, but I, I have felt encouraged that, that God's pushed certain areas of my own life, and maybe he has for your life too, of just saying, hey, you know, I'm with you. I can, I, I'm going to come alongside you and help you through some of these things. And let me just say, you know, in some of these messages, they get a little heavy, and in some of the scripture, you see God get very, very straightforward with people. And today's scripture is one of those where you see, you, you see God come, come right at these guys and tell them straight up what's going to happen. And you can look at a scripture like that and go, man, uh, God's, God's pretty tough there. And, and let me just say this, God sometimes gets tough with us, so he gives us that opportunity to change. He, he gets tough with us in our lives, not so that we could leave church going, man, I'm just the worst person ever. Have you ever left church feeling that way before where you, you go home, you're driving home going, why do I even go to church? I, I, just, feel like I, I, I just feel like I can do nothing right. I, I, can, I feel like, you know, I'm just, I, I'm just a big mess up. And, and hear me this morning. We, we're going to talk about this issue of sin. And anytime we talk about sin, instantly the whole room is like, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, because we all know what we struggle with, right? I mean, when I'm writing this, I'm like, oh, God, oh. In my office, I'm like, oh, dear Lord, you know, and I, you know, but God, God reassures saying, I, I point that stuff out not to make you feel horrible, not to make you feel like you're inadequate, but I point that stuff out so that you can surrender it to me and be free from it so that you can surrender it and give it to me and, and that you don't have to live in that lifestyle. So let me, as we get in, because it's going to get heavy, and I'm, I'm going to come and I, I call them haymakers. I'm going to punch a little bit, and you guys are going to be like, I'm, I'm just going to throw a few haymakers out, all right? And, and when you hear those things, I don't want you to go, man, I'm a horrible person. What I want you to know is that you could be free, and God points certain areas in our life. The Holy Spirit points certain things out so that we can be free from those things, not so that we can leave feeling like we're stuck in them and that we can never get out of it. So this morning, I, I want to give you freedom. To, so if God points something in your heart, deal with it. Let him, let him deal with it. And so in Samuel this morning, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. We're going to talk about a few things in, in Samuel today. We're going to talk about worship. We're going to talk about the cost of ignoring sin, the effects of sin, and get God's desire for us. So those are the four things we're going to cover today. Last week, Pastor Eric talked a lot about worship. He talked a lot about worship and the importance of it and coming into this place and understanding that our worship's about him and not about us. And he said a statement that stuck with me and that I want to read again today. Worship is our need, uh, worship is our need that brings us near God. And it's his asking that keeps us there. I'll read that again. Worship is our need that brings us near God. And it's his asking that keeps us there. Isn't that true? Think about it this morning. We come to this place a lot of times because we realize we need God. Some of you come into this place and you're like, oh, my, my, my family is disrupted. It's, you know, things are going on. Things are horrible. God, I need you. So we come to this place and our asking God brings us to worship. But his asking is what keeps us there. 
So a lot of times we come into this place and we're ready to worship. We're like, God, I, 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 I'm sick, heal me. God, my, my family's uh, you know, on the brink of destruction. God, I don't know what I'm going to do with my marriage. God, I don't know what I'm going to do at work. God, I don't know what I'm going to do about my finances. And we come with the need and our need brings us here. And, and we have no problem sharing that need because we're like, if he can answer it, more power to him, right? Have you ever been in that spot? Maybe you're fine right now, but I've been in spots where I'm like, God, I, I need you, I need you, I need you. But it's his asking that keeps us there. And what that means is a lot of times we come to God with our needs and our worship. And then God asks us for something. Maybe he did that last week. Maybe you wrote in your journal. Maybe he spoke something specific to you and he asks you something. And the asking keeps us there. And that means that we start, we start doing what he asks. But when we don't, we end up backing away and leaving and, and, you know, the crisis is over, and then the next crisis comes, and we come running in. We're like, God, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you. Does that make sense? A lot of times in our need, it's easy to be desperate for God. But it's the follow-through of what he asks us is the hard part. And true worship is staying in the ask part and, and listening and obeying the ask part of what he's asking us to do. And so this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about worship because, because I, I believe one of the biggest struggles we have when it comes to worship is this, is our vanity. Yeah. One of the things we struggle the most with is our vanity. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, um, this is something that, that God spoke to me a few months ago and then re-brought up when I was reading this, the story of Eli's sons, of this issue of, of vanity in our hearts. We live in a culture that's very vain. We live in a culture that's about us, about me, what, what, what can I get, what can I have and if we're not careful, our vanity can be our biggest destruction. Our vanity can make us believe that we're bigger than God. Our vanity can make us believe that we're more important than God. And, and you, can see it, you can see it in people's lives, and maybe sometimes you can see it in your own life in this way, that, that when we become so vain, we start making the world around us instead of around him. Our vanity can destroy us. And this is what happens to Eli's sons in, in chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or their duties as priests. Whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, Eli's sons would send over a servant with three-pronged fork while the meat of the sacrificed animal was still boiling. The servant would stick the fork into the pot and demand that whatever is brought up be given to Eli's sons. All the Israelites who came to worship at Silo were treated this way. Sometimes the servant would come even before the animal's fat had, burned, had, had been burned up at the altar. He would demand raw meat before it and boiled so that it could be used for roasting. The man offering the sacrifice might reply, take as much as you want, but the fat must be burned first. The, then the servant would demand, no, give it to me now or I'll take it by force. So the sin of these young men was very serious in the Lord's sight for they treated the Lord's offering with contempt. What you need to know here is this, is in Old Testament scripture, the, God was very big on this idea of sacrifice. God was very big on this idea of sacrifice, to, to sacrifice of sins. They, they would sacrifice animals, and, and God would put priests in charge. So, so back in the Old Testament, you and I, we couldn't, we couldn't go before God ourselves, but he would require a sacrifice to the priest, and the priest would go before God and offer it up, the very best. And that's what God required, the very best for the forgiveness of sins, the very best to be back in communion with him. And this, this would happen in Samuel. And so these, Eli's sons were in charge of that. But something went wrong with Eli's sons. Eli's sons started to make it the worship about them. Their vanity got so much in the way that they started taking the first fruits for themselves. They'd still go through with the offering part, but they wouldn't follow the ask of what, what God was asking them. So they'd come into the worship place and they would start worshiping, but then they were asked to give up something and they wouldn't do it. They would give something different than what God asked for. And their vanity went so deep, and you'll see later in the scripture that, that their vanity gets so deep that, that they don't even care that they're sinning. They don't even care that, that they're taking what God asked for and they're taking it for themselves. They get confronted later. And when they get confronted later, they, they, they just dismiss it and they don't care and they keep living the way that they want. Vanity can get us in trouble. Vanity can make this world all about ourselves. And when, when, I, when I read this and when I was thinking about this, you know, I, I, I thought about our culture and, and our culture is very vanity-centered, right? 
I mean, think about it today. Facebook, you know, first it, first it started off with Zanga. I don't know anybody, anybody remember Zanga? <laughs> Zanga, right? Then, then we went to MySpace, right? You got, your, you got your cool backgrounds. You know, you got your music that matches, matches your profile picture, you know, and they, or your mood. You know, you're in a happy mood and you have your song on there. You know, you're going, you're, in a, you're having a bad day, so you change it, and you're like, so you had a bad day. You're like listening to it, you're like, that's so, you're like, that's so me right now. You're in love, so you put love songs on, and every time you get there, you, te- you get teary-eyed, you get broken up with, and it's a breakup song. You know, everybody knows your life because of MySpace, right? The backgrounds, it's pretty cool. And then Facebook comes, and Facebook comes in, and, and all of a sudden, we're all about it, and it, it's exciting. And then, and, and here's my theory of why we keep creating new social medias. Moms get a hold of it. <laughs> and, and, and students decide, <laughs> that's not cool anymore. <laughs> so we're going to create a new social network. <laughs> and then moms get hip to that. <laughs> and then moms are on that and kids are like, oh, got to create something new. So Instagram comes about, right? I'm waiting for our newest thing, you know, and Instagram comes and, and people get a hold of it. But think about it. These are all great things and, 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 and they're, they're not bad things. They connect us with each other. It, it's neat to me that I can connect with people that, that live very far away, that, that are part of my past that I, I, I can hang out with, uh, you know, online and talk to. But if we're honest, if I'm honest with myself, it's very easy for my vanity to shine through my Facebook. It's very easy for my vanity to shine through my Instagram. It's very easy for it because, because it invites it. That's what it's all about, really. I mean, think about it. Instagram, or Instagram and Facebook have done this. It's not just good enough to post the pictures you have now. They have this new thing where you can post pictures from two years ago. And so two years ago today, I was here. Right? You, you know, guys, don't know what I'm talking about. Even on Instagram, you're like, you're reposting pictures that were posted years ago because you want to show them off again. That's, that's the culture that we live in. We're always walking around with our phones going, and because we don't want to show we're vain, we put somebody else in there with us. We're like, come here. <laughs> right? Right? We do it, and we're like, we're like and, and, and we, all, we all look at other people. I don't know if you've done this. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest today. We look at other people like, they post a lot of selfies. That <laughs> 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 one's a little vain over there. You know what I'm saying? And then five minutes later, you're like, <laughs> and, and, but you're like, at least I didn't do 10, <laughs> right? We, we, get, we get vanity. All these, all these networks show us how, uh, how truly vain we can be. And some of you are on your phone right now going, delete, 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 delete. Because <laughs> you're like, I don't want people to know. <laughs> but but I, I'm just going to be vulnerable with you in a moment. This issue of vanity, I think it's something that we all struggle with. It's something, if we're all honest, we all struggle with, and it's a part of us. And, and, and God shows us in different ways, and, and sometimes it's probably higher, and sometimes it's probably lower. And there are some of you in here right now that you're, you're high a lot, and God's going to expose that today. He's going to say, hey, you're making this more about you and not about me. And see, our vanity, if it's not checked, it can get us in trouble. And here's why our vanity gets us in trouble. Our vanity gets us in trouble because we start making everything all about us. And there's a problem with that. Inside of us, without God, there's a lot of insecurities. There's a lot of evil. There's a lot of things in our heart that scare us if we truly look at them. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things that if it were left up to us, man, the world would be in trouble. Let me, if I was in charge, <laughs> we would be in trouble. We would. The, the, the thoughts that come in our minds sometimes, think about it. The thoughts that come in our minds sometimes, you're like, I don't want anybody to know that one. <laughs> right? Like, think about it. You're driving from here to San Francisco. You're in traffic. All of a sudden, thoughts start coming in your mind. You're like, I just want to ram everybody and just, <laughs> you know, I just want to run over them. You know, like the thoughts that come to our minds when we're in, in different situations. Our vanity brings out our insecurities. And what the problem with our insecurities, when we make it all about us, we lie, we cheat to get what we want, we cheat to make ourselves look good, we lie to make ourselves look good, we hurt people to make ourselves look good. See, the problem with building our own image and our own vanity is we'll do whatever it takes to make us look good. 
And everyone around us gets hurt in our path. But when we're in God's image, it's the total opposite. When we're in God's image and we start walking in the image that he created for us, we start walking in love, peace, gentleness, self-control, kindness. Galatians 5.25 says it. We start, we start walking in the fruits of the Spirit. Do you see the difference between that? Our vanity brings out our insecurities. Our vanity brings out our insecurities and they, tell, they, they, they say, do whatever it takes to make yourself look good. Do whatever it takes to make your, your family look better than other families. Do whatever it takes to make yourself look good at work. Lie, cheat, steal if you have to. Do whatever it takes to make your image look good. And our, our society tells us to do that. Our society tells us to do that because if you can make yourself happy, then it's all good. But there's only one problem with that. All the stuff that our insecurities drive us for leave us even more empty than when we set out to do them. Because we have to hurt more people. We have to, we have to cheat. We have to lie in more ways. And, and it causes us to get further and further away from who we're truly supposed to be. Here's a test and, and, and that God spoke to my own life, and, and I'll say it for you guys too. You know your vanity is big when you're, you're setting out to please people more than you are God. 